Over the past two years, we've been inundated with all this new Apple Silicon, M1 Pro, M1 Ultra, new MacBook Airs, brand new Mac Studios. We've just had another round of refreshes with the M2 Pro and M2 Max chips. But what about the Mac that started it all? Now that it's 2023, what's going on with the M1 MacBook Air? Because if you remember, there was a fair amount of controversy surrounding it in 2021. Killer USB-C hubs, a supposed defect in the screen, causing the glass to completely shatter and crack without warning, a subsequent class action lawsuit against Apple consisting of all the affected users, the swap memory issue writing terabytes and terabytes of data to the SSD, meaning the SSD would die within two to three years, and supposed overheating due to the lack of a fan, supposedly causing the battery to swell and stop working much quicker than usual. I covered all of these topics on this channel back in 2021, but now that it's been over two years since the launch of the M1 MacBook Air, has anything changed? Should you be worried? Well, probably not, but let me explain. So let's start with the killer USB-C hubs. Now this one actually has a bit of merit because it did happen to a few users shortly after the launch of the M1 Air. A couple of people reported dead MacBook Airs or a strange clicking noise after plugging in a USB-C hub and using the pass-through charging feature, which is when you plug the power brick into the hub and then the hub into your Mac. It seems like in some situations, the USB-C hub bypassed the Mac's built-in safety mechanisms that prevent over-voltage. And this in turn fried the logic board of the MacBook. Now it's hard to say who was at fault here. Was it cheaply built hubs, or maybe an oversight on Apple's behalf? There's no way to tell for sure. I can tell you though, if it was Apple's fault, they'll do everything they can to not admit it. But Apple did release a software update shortly after these issues started popping up. It was macOS Big Sur 11.2.2 and Apple listed this firmware change in the description. In layman's terms, this is the equivalent of a surge protector you'd use to protect from lightning strikes or power surges, but the software equivalent of this. So it does seem like this was in fact an actual issue. And I scoured the internet trying to find evidence of it reoccurring since then. And I did find a several month old Reddit post where someone supposedly had this happen, but they were also running macOS Catalina, not Big Sur, where the firmware update happened and it was also an Intel MacBook from 2019. If you are worried about this happening to your MacBook, just make sure you only use good quality hubs or docks from established brands like Anchor, OWC, or Belkin, for example, and keep your Mac updated. Or like many others, including me, err on the side of caution and don't use pass-through charging on a hub. Use a proper dock for that instead like the CalDigit TS4 I use on my desk. Speaking of things you can use with your MacBook, and just before we get into the next topic of swap memory, here's an app that can make your life a little bit easier. Recently, I had to send someone instructions on how to use filters in our Notion workspace. I realized it takes a lot of time to manually create a step-by-step -step guide. So instead, I used a tool called Scribe that did everything for me. It records exactly what I'm doing on the screen, automatically takes screenshots, and creates a guide that can be shared with anyone. And if you're an employer, student, instructor, or just want to show granny how to connect to the Wi-Fi network, Scribe is a no-brainer. Don't take it from me, here's who else is also using Scribe. All you have to do is install the extension in Chrome or Edge, or simply use a standalone desktop app. Hit start recording and Scribe records your clicks and automatically creates a guide. You can remove steps, edit, highlight, or add steps manually. You can even annotate screenshots. Once you're done, Scribe automatically formats the guide for you and you can share it via a link, save it as a PDF, or even embed the guide into your website. So check out Scribe for free by clicking the link in the description below and start saving yourself a ton of time. Okay, moving on, we have everyone's favorite M1 MacBook Air controversy, swap memory. Now, swap memory is what happens when all of your available RAM, which stands for random access memory, is currently being utilized, but your Mac still needs more. For example, maybe you only have eight gigabytes of RAM and you have a lot of internet browser tabs open at the same time. So some of the memory currently in use is swapped 
to your internal SSD so that your MacBook doesn't slow down too much. Obviously the SSD is much slower than your RAM, so it's not ideal, but this solution is still better than your Mac simply crashing or telling you that opening more programs isn't possible, for example. Where this becomes a problem is if you're constantly using a lot of swap memory. All of this swap memory is being written to your internal SSD, which has a finite amount of data that can be written to it before eventually dying. A dead SSD is bad because it's soldered onto the logic board of your Apple Silicon MacBook and cannot be replaced. Back in early 2021, there were reports of extremely excessive swap memory usage to the tune of up to several hundred gigabytes per day from normal everyday use. I did a number of experiments and tests on this channel back then and was able to replicate some of it. But just like the killer USB-C hubs issue, Apple released a couple of software updates to the macOS operating system. Swap memory usage appeared to decrease and the controversy died down pretty quickly. So two years later, is it still an issue? Possibly. Swap memory still occurs in almost every workflow, regardless of how much RAM you have. It's not a bad thing at all and actually does a great job at improving the overall Mac experience. However, if you are consistently maxing out your available RAM, over time this can add up. The biggest example of this I see is people purchasing MacBooks with only eight gigabytes of RAM and then slamming them with intense multitasking or 4K video editing, for example. Workflows that should really be done on a machine with more RAM or an entirely different machine altogether, like the more powerful M1 Pro or M1 Max. For example, this is a base model M1 MacBook Pro with just eight gigabytes of RAM, editing a fairly complicated DaVinci Resolve timeline with a lot of fusion effects. You can see the memory pressure is quite high with a large amount of swap memory being used. Now, ideally this person would have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM in this situation because just the Resolve application itself is using over eight gigabytes of RAM. And that's before all the other apps and even macOS itself is taken into consideration. But if we take a look at the total amount of data written to their SSD after one year of doing this kind of extreme workflow, you can see they've written about 31 terabytes in total. Considering this MacBook also has a 256 gigabyte SSD, what kind of lifespan could they expect before the SSD might fail? Well, the TBW rating or terabytes written rating is a good indicator of this. TBW is the amount of data that can be written to an SSD before the SSD might begin to have issues and potentially develop a greater risk of failing. The key word there is might. The TBW value for most 256 gigabyte SSDs is 150. So hypothetically, this person, who is an extreme example, can likely keep using this MacBook in this exact way for five years and not have any issues. But remember when I said might? In reality, most SSDs actually blow through their TBW rating and can double or even triple it before failing. I won't go into too much detail here as I made an extremely in-depth video on this topic with tons of research, which I will link down below if you want to learn more. So even if you did make a mistake when configuring your MacBook and went with the base model RAM option instead of 16 gigabytes, for example, or you simply couldn't afford to upgrade the RAM, probably not a big deal even if you do use a fair amount of swap memory. The SSD will likely last longer than the MacBook itself. Also, if you wanna find out exactly how much RAM you should get, I made a video on that too. Anyway, after scouring the internet over the last couple of weeks, I couldn't find any evidence or examples of M1 MacBooks failing due to a TBW exceeded SSD. So I don't think it's anything to worry about, but to play devil's advocate here, if this is in fact an issue, it likely won't come to a head until at least the five year mark, which is in 2025, where the MacBooks, like the one I used as an example just before, actually start to exceed their 150 terabyte TBW ratings. Next up, let's talk about the cracked screens. A couple of months after the USB-C hub issue, another issue popped up, this time with the glass screen on M1 MacBook Air models. Now I made a really detailed video at the time, going through all the allegations, evidence, and 
seeing if there was any truth to these claims. And I encourage you to watch that video for all of this information, as well as how to take care of your screen and ensure it won't get damaged. Long story short, at the time, it didn't seem widespread enough to be considered a major issue. There were a couple of hundred people in an Apple support thread that claimed to have cracked screens and a few Reddit posts, but this was out of millions of M1 MacBook Air units sold, which to me is within manufacturing tolerances. I mean, you'll always have a small percentage of manufactured products like a glass screen that just break or have imperfections causing it to be more brittle. And also, I mean, let's be honest here. Some people straight up crack the screen themselves by using webcam covers or closing the screen with debris on the keyboard or something blocking the screen from closing properly, like a sweatshirt drawstring or a bag buckle. For example, some of the randomly cracked screen posts are similar to this one, which has an obvious impact point. And you can see the keyboard is quite dirty too. All it takes is closing the screen on something small, like a grain of rice, and the glass can crack. And this is true for any laptop, not just MacBooks. But something I couldn't investigate further at the time was the concept of fatigue failure. Basically, fatigue failure means if you do something over and over again, over time, any small flaws or imperfections may grow larger and sometimes turn into a complete component failure or a cracked screen in this case. A lot of people claimed that the hinge or entire display assembly of the MacBook Air was just too tight and over time it could put stress on the glass. So by opening and closing the screen hundreds of times over the course of two years, if there is a manufacturing defect in this model, around now is when we should start to see major issues occurring. And note that at this point in time, no one has identified a specific defect or flaw, not even Lewis Rossman. So after doing some research and searching for any new updates on this topic, I've pretty much come to the same conclusion I did in 2021. Doesn't seem like this is a widespread issue or there's an inherent flaw in the display. That being said, the videos I've made and the articles I wrote on this subject are at the top of Google search results. So they're one of the first things people see if they search for this topic. As a result, I have seen quite a few comments on my own videos about cracked M1 Air screens. If I had to estimate, I'd say anywhere from maybe 100 to 200 people have commented explaining their situation and that the screen did crack without any input from them. But still, there's just not enough hard evidence to suggest these screens are defective, even after two years. I mean, even if a couple of thousand people, for example, have experienced this issue, compared to the millions and millions of MacBook units out there, that's a tiny percentage. And I'm certainly not defending Apple here either. They do have a track record of major defects like this one that only reached settlement last year and countless others. So that being said, just be aware that the screen on the Air model in particular may be more fragile than maybe what you're used to, especially due to the sheer thinness of the Air chassis. Just err on the side of caution and don't put anything between the screen and keyboard like a webcam cover or keyboard cover. And watch out for any debris on the keyboard when shutting the screen. Use a good case for transport and you should be fine. This also extends to the class action lawsuit that was announced in 2021. Pretty much nothing about the situation has changed since then. Apple has asked the law firm spearheading the lawsuit to gather more evidence and plaintiffs. And as of the date of this video, still seems to be stuck in limbo with not enough traction to go anywhere. Again, if you're interested in a full breakdown and explanation of this lawsuit, I made a separate video about it. Finally, we come to the overheating issue. Now I'm not gonna take too long here to A, save you time and B, because I've already debunked this a few times before. The too long don't watch summary is, don't worry about it. The M1 MacBook Air will only heat up to a significant temperature when undertaking an extremely demanding task. like rendering a video or playing a game. Even then, the majority of the heat is emitted from the very top of the device, where the actual M1 SoC is located, as you can see in these thermal readings. The battery is located at the complete opposite end of the chassis, away from the concentration of heat. Sure, the chassis does heat up overall, but the internal temperature of the battery itself only increases slightly and is still within normal tolerances. And again, 99% of the time, you're not gonna be running your fanless entry-level M1 MacBook Air this hard and this hot. That's pretty much it. 
Despite all of these controversies, I think the M1 MacBook Air still stands out as one of the best laptops we've seen in recent history. And I'll see you in 2025 for my next update.